Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I've just proven that you cannot fill a lecture hall by talking about standards. So, <laughs> okay. Um, this talk will be about Vert.io. I'll talk a little bit about the motivation for doing Vert.io uh, and a little bit about the motivation for doing a standard. Um, and then we'll go through some of the history. Um, but the core of this will basically be a laundry list of changes that we've made in the 1.0 standard. Um, that means I'm gonna have to talk fairly fast because when I put them all together, I realized there's a little bit more than we'd originally intended in that. Um, so we go through those changes. And then there'll be a summary, and hopefully at the end we'll have five minutes for questions, but you're welcome to interrupt at any time and ask a question or heckle. Okay, motivation. Um, basically, there are differences between a real physical device and a device in a virtualized system. And it comes down to pretty much the fact that with real hardware, you poke it, it does work, but you don't pay for that work. So register accesses on real hardware are relatively quick. Um, but memory access, if it needs to suck something out of your memory, it has to set up DMA. So there's a latency involved in that. When you're inside a guest in a virtualized system, the host that's emulating your device, for example, or pretending to be your device, those accesses, when you hit, hit a register on your device, tend to be fairly slow. In a lot of cases, they'll cause an exit. So the whole guest will basically pack up, the host will run for a while, and the guest will come back. So that, that becomes quite expensive. Um, but memory accesses, it can just access your memory as fast as you can. So there's no latency involved in memory accesses. So different trade-offs eventually lead everyone to implementing paravirtual drivers, or paravirtual devices. So in a nutshell, that's the motivation for paravirtualization. So basically not emulating hardware directly, but doing something special. Now, this was my argument for when I wrote NAT, too. If you're going to do something that's horrible, try to do it well. Um, I came to regret that decision, but I'm sure I've learned a lot <laughs> since then. So let's make them not suck. And this language here, anything in italics like this, is actually a quote from the standard document itself. Um, what we want is something that is straightforward, obviously efficient, standard, and extensible. So straightforward means, for example, that a device should build on existing buses. It should be generally PCI. Um, everyone expects in their machine to have PCI devices. So why as well present it as a PCI device? It solves a whole of already solved problems, like how do I find what devices are, and how do I tell them apart, all that stuff. There's a whole very thick standard on that stuff. Let's use it. Let's not create some boutique hypervisor bus. Uh, I'm not going to mention any names. Oops. <laughs> Uh, but there's also uh, MMIO, uh, an alternate bus in the standard, which is basically designed for embedded systems. It's not really a bus at all. It's just basically a page of registers. Uh, and generally, it's either the device tree is what informs the, uh, the guest what it has, or even on the, command, the kernel command line in Linux, you can do it. Um, and for the S390 guys, there's the uh, S390 folks have the CCW um, transport which is an all, another thing that's much more compatible with what they do because they generally, traditionally, don't support PCI. So straightforward also means that these things should look like normal devices. You know, you poke the registers, they interrupt you when stuff's going to happen. <coughs> straightforward. OK. <coughs> Efficient. In this case, that means batching possible in courage. You shouldn't have to poke a whole heap of registers to do stuff. It should pretty much be able to batch up operations where possible. Um, obviously, it means you support interrupt suppression by the driver. Um, and so the driver can say, look, don't bother me for a while because taking interrupts um, is something that you basically, while you need to do it, you obviously need to be able to suppress it in some way. Um, and notification suppression by the device. So the device needs to say, look, don't hit my registers and force an exit because don't worry, I'm on it, I'm doing stuff. So that's the, the basic way you get efficiency. Standard. Well, obviously, if you're writing a standard, you want it to be standard. That's a little bit tautological. But in this case, it goes a bit further. When you look at what people have done in this space before, they have firstly considered only how they'll implement it on their hypervisor and come up with a boutique solution for their hypervisor and expected every operating system on the planet to implement whatever crazy idea that they came up with. But also, they tended to use different mechanisms for the block 
device that they were implementing and the network device they were implementing and the console device they were implementing and the et cetera, et cetera. Vertigo devices actually share a ring buffer and descriptor mechanism, and that's standard. Whether it's a network device or a uh, GL virtualization thingy or whatever crazy stuff you're doing, it will have this ring buffer and descriptor mechanism. And we call that a vert queue, and this is another quote. Um, and a vert queue is basically you put descriptors in that can basically be scatter gather lists of this memory over here, this memory over here, et cetera, and the device consumes them in some way and tells you when it's finished with them. And we use that mechanism for all our devices. Now, it's called a queue even though it's not technically a queue because it can be evaluated out of order, but for most devices, you want it in order. A block device is the obvious exception. It needs to be able to service requests out of order, otherwise you're forcing um, a huge performance problem on yourself. But for network devices, they're going to be in order. Console devices, they, you hope they're in order, etc. Okay, but standard also means that the same devices operate on top of different transports. So net, block, SCSI, console, whatever it is you've got, uh, balloon device, all use the same vertio infrastructure. So use these vert queues I talked about. We use feature bits, which we'll mention in a moment. You have a standard config space for it to publish stuff to you. And you use that whatever bus you're on. So all of them share that vertio infrastructure on top of whatever bus you happen to choose. Um, now, we tend to talk about this from the point of view of the driver author, because, you know, most people, are, more people are going to be writing drivers than are going to be writing hypervisors, despite the trend recently for everyone to write their own hypervisor. Um, <laughs> but, of course, this structure is mirrored on the other side. They will also have their PCI bus implementation, and they will also have their vert queues implementation from the other side, um, and their network device and their block device, etc. So, the structure applies both ways. Extensible. In this case, we offer a bit, a bit, a bit set of features. Um, and basically, the device says, here's all the stuff I support, and the driver says, here's the subset that I understand. This gives you both forwards and backwards compatibility. So a crazy new device will support all these feature bits. Old driver will go, I understand that one, and that's it. So. In real silicon, what tends to happen is eventually you go, legacy's too hard, we're going to release a 2.0 version and everybody has to update their drivers. This is software, we should be able to do slightly better than that. So this is an extensibility mechanism that's actually served us remarkably well so far. So that's the motivation and that's what we have. History. This is what it looks like. And I actually went back through the Git history to look at some of these. Um, Git commits are not always reflective of when the work happened, but the kernel implementation of this, uh, Vodeo PCI and also Vodeo LGUEST, um, so there's another bus that I didn't mention there because it's not in the spec, and that is the LGUEST bus, which is basically an array of descriptors. Um, that went in in 2007 in, in the kernel, labeled experimental, so of course no one was ever going to use it in production. <clears throat> um, the QMU PCI implementation merged in the main QMU tree uh, actually a year later in 2008. Um, it was obviously floating around before that. And that same year, uh, the S390 people took basically what I'd done for LGUEST and made a variant for the S390 platform. So they produced their own custom bus. Um, it was the year after that we decided that PCI was where the action was. So we were going to create an actual spec, um, nominally independent of the implementation in QMU and implementation in Linux, we'd produce a spec that would give you everything you need to know to implement something compatible. And it was focusing on PCI, so it was called Vertigo PCI, draft spec. Um, and I did that in Lix because I just like to confuse everyone by using different technologies all over the place. Um, it, it was an interesting choice. Um, and it was also the year that uh, VirtualBox 3.1 came out, and that supported Vertigo Net. So we had our first completely implement independent, I you know, only heard out about when someone told me about it, implementation of Vert.io, uh, when they supported Vert.io and Vert .io Net. Um, you know, things roll along for a few years. Uh, 2011, we got the MMIO bus uh, merged into Linux, and that's the embedded, uh, embedded bus where you don't have PCI and you just have a few descriptors that describe what devices you've got. Um, so bus is a little bit of an overstatement. Uh, the year later, the S390 people actually figured that the really crappy implementation I'd written for, written for LGS that they had copied was, in fact, a terrible, terrible idea, and came up with a real bus, the CCW bus support, which is much more S390-like. So much so I have trouble reading that part of the spec, but it, it, has, it, it has S390-like words in there. So 
Um, <laughs> and I had hoped to say that 2014 FreeBSD 10.0 would be released. It isn't quite. It's been pushed back again. Uh, January 14th is the current due date. Um, but something really exciting happened in FreeBSD 10. Uh, they implemented Beehive, which is um, legacy-free FreeBSD guest running on FreeBSD host, basically. Uh, and Beehive uses all Vert.io for all their I.O. Um, somebody told me about it and I took a look and went, wow, they've independently implemented all this. Um, and so we've dragged them into the standards process as well, because uh, that's actually really cute. Um, so that, so FreeBSD 10 will be Vert.io out of the box for Beehive, which is great. Now, in 2012 there, um, a strange thing happened. Um, this is actually from a Google Plus post. Uh, which I had given me permission to repost. Um, the Galaxy Nexus device actually uses Vert.io to talk to the, effectively, um, AMP system. So the other chips uh, on, the, on the machine, um, they actually said, hey, let's use Vert.io, Vert queues and everything to communicate with these. Uh, and they came up with a method called RP message. You can see the kernel post there. It's, it's now in the kernel. Um, and so they've taken the similar idea that you've got this guest and host uh, and the host can view all the guests' memory, but not necessarily vice versa. How do they communicate efficiently? It's mapped straight across to a very similar problem that they have. Um, and so they use Vert.io in these devices that we all have in our pockets. Well, hopefully most of us have in our pockets. Um, so that was kind of cool and very, very random um, that that came out. Um, but the real funny thing that happened in 2012 that's relevant to this talk uh, was an email that I got uh, from Helen uh, a lawyer at Arm who said they, had, they, they liked Vert.io, they really wanted to use it for their fast models. So Arm don't actually uh, fab chips, they do designs and other people, their, their partners fab all the chips. Uh, if you want to do development, um, Arm give you uh, an emulator basically called, that they call a fast model. Uh, and you use that to do all your development and hopefully when the hardware comes along it all, it all works great. Um, and they thought, hey, it would be really good to have a decent um, I.O. system for this, um, rather than emulating whatever it is they're doing at the moment, we should use Vert.io, said one of the engineers, and they went, great. This email followed with, so what are the IP licensing rules around the Vert.io spec? Um, my answer, of course, was it's basically a glorified blog post. You break it, you get to keep both pieces. <laughs> um, they went away after that, so that was good. About three weeks later, I got an email, confidential internal email from someone in IBM I had never heard of before because they had figured out that I worked for IBM and therefore IBM obviously knew what I was doing and they reached into the organisation and the organisation reached through to me and said, what is the IP issues around the approval that you got for releasing the spec? So basically, <laughs> if we think of the spec and it really, the draft spec was really a white paper. <laughs> There is, I have learned, a process for publishing a white paper in IBM, and it's not that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, to be completely honest, I'm actually not sure what it is. But <laughs> it was made quite clear to me in a number of long meetings that it is not that. So. Uh, <laughs> You know what I say? Time for a proper standard. Um, so one solution to this, I mean, the standard solution to these kind of IP issues of you know, who's sharing what and everything else is you, 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 you make it a standard. And they have all that infrastructure in place and everyone agrees what the IP you know, licensing or lack of licensing or whatever it is is, and everyone's happy with it. So that was really the push to, to do a standard. Um, because it made it obvious that Increasingly, the barriers to Vert.io adoption were not technical, they were at this political and legal side. So it was time to step up. When you've got larger enterprises, they really need this help in order to use your stuff. So, and that importantly makes, the other thing about a standard is it does draw people. Nobody else is trying to do a standard here. Nobody else is trying to create something that works across all operating systems and all hypervisors. Right? They're all interested in their own hypervisors. So having a standard that's actually a standard TM standard has some draw, particularly on large organisations. It's hard for them to escape the swell of knowing that there is a standard there. So it just 
means that it makes it an easier choice for others to follow. So this actually helps Vert.io, which hopefully helps all of us, because standards across this space do increase competition and reduce lock-in. But while we're there, why don't we try to fix up some stuff? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just, you know. To quote from our charter, keep the good, discard the bad, and make the ugly optional. This is, um, yes, I wrote that bit too. OK. Uh, OK, but the first thing you need to do when you take something that was basically a glorified blog post and turn it into a standard is use RFC style language. I'm a big fan of this. This is, in fact, the last thing we did, but it should have been the first thing we did. Um, rather than saying, oh, the driver can check before accessing, you know, say stuff like the driver must check and must actually has a specific meaning, which means, you know, um, flames will erupt from the keyboard if you don't follow it, I believe. Um, <laughs> But also, you know, as I said, we tend to talk about the, the driver. We tend to go, okay, so um, we think about driver authors when we're writing the spec. But the spec really has two parts. It's for the driver authors and the device authors as well. So it has to very clearly say, the driver must do this. The device must do this. Um, and we also had terminology. We talked a lot about host and guest. But then in the back of my mind are these crazy guys on the Nexus going, we're actually talking between different CPUs. So. The language was formalized down to device and guest, and we basically went through and went, yes, let, let's just, you know, just tighten up the language a bit. Um, so that was, it actually matters, but um, it was a fairly minor change. Um, yeah, so I said we had these feature bits that you negotiate and the device presents. Um, I think of the standards battle as being, the reason we're doing a standard is because of new users that are going to come to open up this, the floodgates so everyone will start using Vertio in the future. So if you think of the graph, that means you've got more users in front of you than you have behind you. So to some extent, you can burn the users behind you for the sake of the users in front of you. <laughs> Which means you have this tension between simplicity. In 10 years' time, people read the Vertio 1 spec, and they find all this legacy crap in there. They're going, I can't believe I've got to implement all this crap. I'm just going to go do my own thing. So you want simplicity for the 1.0 people, but you still want compatibility for the poor people who are actually using this, your stuff today because they believed in you. Um, so, okay. So you're always going to have this tension between compatibility and simplicity. And adding a bit to say, I am compliant with the spec, which everyone must set, is actually a pretty ugly thing to do. And every driver that is compliant with the spec must accept. Um, I, it's the only non-optional feature um, is definitely not simplicity for those who only care about 1.0, but obviously it makes compatibility a lot easier. So on the whole, you know, compatibility, simplicity thing, that's more towards compatibility than simplicity. Now, while we're talking about simplicity, there were a couple of feature bits that were crap and we just took it out. Feature bits seem like a really good idea. The idea is you add something new and then you can set a feature bit so everyone knows about it, it'll all be beautiful. In practice, some feature bits are documenting our bugs. Um, the Vertio F any layout feature bit is, could it be called Vertio F I actually read the damn standard feature bit? Because <laughs> when you give something to the device, you give it the scatter gather list of, you know, here's some stuff over here, so here's some stuff over here. For example, a network device. Um, you know, here's the header that tells you about the packet that I'm sending you uh, and the checksum information and all that stuff, metadata that you need, and here's the actual network packet. Now, a simple implementation, of course, will put one descriptor for that bit and use a second descriptor to describe the rest of the packet, etc. cetera. Um, and the Linux implementation did that. The spec very clearly says you shouldn't rely on those boundaries. Someone should be able to either have, you know, 10 bytes here and then the rest of it here and then use a third descriptor for the thing, or actually, as we discovered that we really wanted to do where possible, use one descriptor to cover the whole packet for short packets, including the header. Well, the QMU implementation, which was copied from the LGUEST implementation, which is deliberately supposed to be minimal, just went, the first descriptor will cover the network header, right? And just have an assert that that is true. Um, the only way to fix that is to add a feature bit. So modern QMUs say, no, 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 I really do actually handle any layout, and modern devices have to follow it. So that is basically a documentation of our own idiocy. And as of 1.0, that is eliminated because we say, no, 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 you really, 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 really will have read the spec this time, and we're removing the feature bit. Similarly, we had notify on empty, which turned out to be a terrible, uh, it was actually a feature that we added because we th I thought we needed it, but actually it was fixing a bug, and when I fixed the bug, we didn't need the feature anymore, so um, it was never actually used, so we're just uh, shuffling that under the carpet for a while. 
Vertqs. I'm going to get into a little bit of details about Vertqs because I think they're a kind of interesting, uh, interesting data structure in a very boring way. Um, so a vert queue is basically a descriptor table. This is where it says, you know, I've got a bit of memory over here, I've got a bit of memory over here, and a bit of memory over here. You can chain them together. It has a flags field, so address, length, flags, and a next field, which points to the next one if you're going to chain them into multiples. So you set up your descriptor table, you put your entry in, and then you put it in the available ring. You put the ID, the, the index of that, in the available ring, and you increment the index so they can see the next bit in the available ring. So obviously you can do multiple by bumping the index a long way. These are circular ring buffers. OK. So the device finishes with it. It puts the ID back in the used ring and writes out the length that it actually wrote into the descriptor, which turns out to be important for some cases. OK. So what used to happen is we had, because we don't want the used ring on the same cache line as the available ring, I went 4096 is bigger than anyone's caches. So we'll round it up to 4096. Um, and the device will say how big these rings are. They're all the same size. The power of two, so it'll say, you know, it's 256 elements, the Q size. And that will, therefore, you can derive the whole size of the thing with the padding and the whole bit. That turns out to be a really bad idea because if you want to perform a networking, you might want a really, really big, no, actually, for networking, you actually don't want a huge Q because that's, you end up with um, buffer bloat issues. But, for some devices, you want to go, no, 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 I really want a massive queue of requests. And so you go, I want 32,000, which is the maximum number of descriptors you can have, which works out I need something like uh, order of 32 contiguous pages. And so if the guest has been running for a while, when you just pop this device pops in, it goes, I can't get that. It just can't drive the device. So we fix this in two ways. One, the driver for all the transports can now negotiate the size. Sometimes the device hits, the, will set a maximum size, but the driver can actually say, no, I actually am only going to put in two descriptors because I'm open BIOS, for example, or core boot, um, and I just want to get this thing far enough to get into the real operating system. I don't want to waste more than you know, a couple of K of memory. Um, and in fact, those bits which are basically independent no longer have to be contiguous. So you can, even if you do have large descriptors, you no longer have to have one large chunk. You can have three large chunks, um, or three slightly smaller chunks. Now this is, introduces another axis to our compatibility simplicity, and that is flexibility or features. So we've basically gone, yeah, there's kind of compatibility in there, because this is, you could treat this the way you did before. Uh, we haven't gained any simplicity at all, but you know, we've got some flexibility. So we've actually left our line, and yeah, this is where that analogy hole breaks down. But <clears throat> um, we're about there. So, that actually turns out to be quite important. Now, this is the most obscure part of the standard, and I left this in my talk because I wanted to cover everything we changed. And this is the most obscure thing that we changed. So, I talked about the descriptor table. You say, here's all my bits of memory. In this case, we've got five bits of memory. So the next flag, you know, next flag is set on four of them, and the next point is point down. They don't have to be contiguous in the table, but in this case, they are. So there's our five bits of memory. Now, that means that if you're putting big buffers in, it's actually going to chew up a lot of your descriptor table. So we added a feature called Vertigo Feature Indirect Desk. And if you support this, and every, everyone has since about 2009 when it was introduced, um, you can say, actually, indirect flag, this descriptor actually points to the table of descriptors and follow that table. So you know you use less descriptors. You've got to do a memory, dynamic memory allocation, but in some cases, this wins, particularly for block devices. Really, really large requests. Everyone loves them. But we have the problem of ring negotiation that if you asked, if the, if the device said, I want really huge rings, you might not get anything at all. So therefore, it couldn't ask for more than about 256 anyway. So your block device performance sucks. So indirect, awesome. Um, so what you could do is set indirect and next, which means first go down to this table and go through that. But when that runs out, come back and follow the next chain. And that may be a direct. It could be another indirect. We could do all kinds of cool tricks here. No one ever used it. Um, and it made it a lot harder to implement, so I just ripped it out. Whoa, yes, simplicity wins. But um, we, we kind of lost a bit of, well, theoretical, theoretical compatibility uh, sucked, but and no one ever, ever did this, so we can ignore it. And flexibility, in theory, this would allow us to do lots of multiple scatter gather lists. We can always add that back in with another feature bit if we want. Let's not do that. Status byte formulation. So there's this, I, I hate bring up for this kind of stuff. And I thought, you know what? I just want a byte in every device where you set I have seen the device, and another bit to say, I have found a driver for the device, another bit to say, the driver's good, and then a bit to say, I have failed. And I think of these as kind of attached to traffic lights on the console, so you kind of go, you know, goes, goes you know, 
red to, to green and then back to red or it'll go to, you know, whatever. So that you get some just, if all else fails, you will get something. Um, now, that was supposed to be purely informative, but it turns out we have a problem now. We've got more than 32 feature bits that they're supposed to acknowledge the feature bits, right, before they start using it. But if you've got an infinite number of feature bits, how do you know when they finish acknowledging them and they're just not ignoring the rest? So we added a new status bit to say features OK. And so that means when you set that bit, it means I finished feature negotiation. Everything I've accepted, that's it. It's locked in. I can't change it. But while we're there, let's just add another feature. And that is that, in theory, everyone is supposed to implement, everyone, how should I put this, RFC style, everyone should implement the complete set of feature bits. So you should handle ancient devices that only accept one or none of your features. In practice, we know people will not do that. They'll go, oh, no, everyone uses, everyone handles indirect these days. They'll, they'll accept that feature bit. This gives them a way to do that cleanly. So when they set feature OK, you just unset it again. So they should set it and read it back. And that way the driver goes, OK, it didn't like the features that I accepted. Sure, it shouldn't ever do that. But it does give you a way of notifying and saying, I'm not going to try to drive the device because we can't agree how, how the device is going to work. So we kind of ratcheted that in. Again, we didn't really gain much except flexibility. <sighs> this is even worse, configuration atomicity. We have this configuration area. It's great for put where, you know, in a network card, it's where you put your Mac, um, uh, your Mac address. In, in uh, block devices, it's where, what the size of the block device is, et cetera. Um, this is actually writable by the guest as well. So it can actually push stuff in there. Tends to be a bad idea, but it is used in a couple of cases. So somebody went, the problem is if you've got multiple devices, like what if you've got a ge uh, geometry information for your block device and it can change? How do you read it safely? And the answer currently is, well, hope it doesn't change, or try reading it twice and see if it did change. Neither of these apparently is you know, really considered robust or adequate. So every transport now provides an atomicity counter. So you read the counter, you read the fields, you read the counter again. If it changed, you know something has been updated. Uh, with correct memory barriers in there, this is safe. So, and writing multi-byte fields, we talked about it. We just went, we don't do it, and we'll never create a device that requires it. Just don't go there. So we got a little bit of... It's not too bad on the simplicity front, but it is basically a bug fix. Okay. Video net changes. This is what everyone cares about because uh, everyone loves their network devices. First off, I pulled out a feature bit that was never used. So modern network, to network cards can do GSO, um, basically segmentation offload. So you send the card a really big packet, and it chops it up for you into little packets. It saves you round trips in, in your network stack. It saves you uh, lots of talking to the driver. It's basically, you know... A, an aggressive, well, it's an interesting network specific form of batching. So I thought, hey, cool, I'll add a feature bit to the spec that says we do GSO. Um, when I came to actually implement it, uh, and there's probably a moral here about something about not doing it in this order. <laughs> See, there are specific types of GSO. There's TSO4 and TSO6 for TCPv6. There's UFO that they may or may not do. And then there's the issue with ECN bits in TCP packets, which it may or may not support correctly. So saying I do GSO is not, in, not correct. In fact, you've got to have four feature bits to say what kinds it supports, at least. So we exploded this into four others, and this was never, ever, ever used by anyone. So out it goes. OK. Uh, but mostly, VertioNet has, has stayed the same. Vertio block. I ripped out a whole heap of stuff. Vertigo block F SCSI. I had this really good idea that, hey, for our block device, we should be able to say, I want to, I want to send a SCSI command through to my block device, mainly to eject the CD, right? That was the main thing you wanted to do. You have a CD, you send a SCSI eject command. Um, but in theory, it was a generic, you could send any SCSI command through. Um, you can imagine what a great idea that turned out to be. Uh, no one actually used it that way. And now we have Vertigo SCSI. If you want SCSI, you know where to find it. So we took it out. Uh, I also had no idea how modern devices do barriers. So I said, I oh, will have a barrier bit that says, when you do this right, make sure you flush every other right before it. That was never used because that's not how we, that's not how the block guys roll. And now we add, so we added a flush bit where you actually have a flush command to say, flush the device. Um, and that used to be an option, so that's now compulsory. So we ripped all those out. I also was on this kick where in the header, to keep it aligned, I had a 16-bit value, a hole. It looks kind of messy in the specs. I thought, I'll put an I.O. priority field in there. And I'll define it loosely so, like, you know, higher numbers mean higher I.O. priority and lower numbers mean lower, and up, the rest is implementation divided up to you and everything else. 
with us, such a such a great spec and such an important feature, nobody ever used it. So we're just ripping it out. It's now called unused again. So that's all simplicity. Whole heap of stuff ripped out of Vertigo Block. It is back to being a very, very simple block device. If you want things complicated, Vertigo SCSI is where you want to be. OK. Vertigo Balloon. Does everyone know what a balloon driver is? OK. Does everyone not know what a balloon driver is? I should ask that question. OK. Good. OK, that's, there we go. OK. And therefore, I assume that about 30% of you are asleep. <laughs> OK. Um, this is a Zen thing. And it was actually quite a clever Zen thing. Um, basically, you have the concept of a balloon inside your guest. And so your guest is like this big. It's got this much memory. Uh, and you can tell the guest, please inflate the balloon. And it would basically push pages into the balloon and crowd itself into the rest of memory. Um, and this, the pages inside this balloon could be used by other machines on the system. So basically, it would push pages into the balloon as requested and squeeze itself into the rest of memory. And then, of course, for, for whatever reason it needed to expand again, it would pull pages, deflate, deflate the balloon, and re-expand it into space. So I think uh, like this is a poor, poor person's uh, memory hot plug, basically. But despite being so trivial, it's actually amazingly effective in a lot of scenarios. So we implemented, a, and by we, I mean somebody else, uh, implemented a balloon device uh, spec. Um, it uses the config space to say what balloon size it should be. Only, unlike every other part of the spec, it gets the endian wrong and says it is always little endian. Um, so that was wrong. Um, it also has a stats field, so the device can ask the driver, hey, what are your memory stats in the system? And it uses a U64 and a U8, U16, and they have, they have to be crammed together. It has to be packed, because you can ask for multiple of them. So there's an alignment issue. Um, means that all your alignment will then be out for everything. Um, and it also has a feature which says, please tell me before you pull a page out of the balloon. Don't just fault it in. Please tell me. That was to support a theoretical hypervisor that would require that. But the problem is that what does the, that theoretical hypervisor that requires that feature do if the, if the device says, sorry, if the driver says, actually, I don't, I don't accept that bit. You're like, well, I need you to. Um, unplug the device again. <laughs> you lose it. Um, presumably, you wanted a balloon in there for some reason. It was, it, was, it was an optional, it was a compulsory optional feature bit, uh, which led to all kinds of strangeness uh, when it was appreciated. And it turned out nobody ever needed that feature bit anyway. So we did the best and simplest thing possible and ripped the Vertigo balloon. It is proposed to rip the Vertigo balloon entirely out of the spec uh, and replace it with something that is really, really simple um, and doesn't have these issues. Um, of course, the discussion, hey, if we're writing our ideal balloon, do you know what else we could do? Has arisen, and we're going through that battle now. So at the moment, it's looking like ultimate in simplicity, it, it may be something else. We may be up the top of the feature triangle again, but I'm hoping for simplicity. So we're basically just not going to include it in the spec. And that doesn't mean it doesn't exist and it doesn't exist in legacy. It doesn't mean that it can't be that feature, that device number can't be reserved for people who want to implement it. But the proposal is with Working Draft 2 is it won't be in the spec. So clear that. PCI changes. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because there's actually not many. Um, we wanted things like the ability to negotiate the queue size and we wanted more than 32 feature bits and all that stuff. So obviously, we have to change the layout in PCI space. Now, we had an issue in PCI space um, where everything was in bar zero. So if you don't know PCI, you can go to sleep for a bit now. Um, everything was laid out in, in bar zero, and you had all the registers for the device and stuff that you needed to know. And then you had the driver-specific stuff. So if it was a network card, it was a network stuff. If it was a block device, it was a block stuff, whatever. Then someone added MSI, and they went, where do we put this in this continuous bar? I know. When you turn MSI on, we'll insert the fields at the end and move the device-specific ones across. And if you turn it off again, they move back. And then we thought, OK, that's ugly. But what happens when someone else adds one? Another thing they want to extend it with, are we going to have this complicated spec where you have a state machine that says, if you turn this bit on, it's at this location. Otherwise, it's here. And multiply that by the number of, no. We decided to actually separate them out and use the PCI capability list to point out where they are, which also allows you to put them in other crazy places. Um, so yeah, uh, in some ways, it's a little bit simpler than that whole moving thing, because they're specified up front. Um, it does allow compatibility, because you can still have bar zero there with the old style. If they access that, you go, I know what you're doing. Uh, you're you're an, a legacy driver. Um, but uh, yeah, 
um, it also gets a little bit complicated with following the chain and stuff. It turns out that modern PCI devices, you're supposed to be able to access them even if you can't access one of the I.O. bars according to the spec. So what everyone does is they put in like a magic little way of poking stuff in. And apparently this is now the norm. Um, and so we want to be there with the cool kids. So Vertio spec also has this backdoor way of poking through registers, which I really hate, but is in the spec. Okay. The worst one, however, is the specter of Endianness. This Vertio is defined as guest Endian because I'm brilliant. <laughs> because guess what could be simpler? You're writing a guest driver. Don't worry about Endian. The host obviously knows what Endian you are, right? Because it's doing all this stuff for you anyway. Just chill, man. Don't worry about the Endian. Just, you know, write natural, be free. So it turns out simple is not the same as straightforward. Straightforward is what I expect. Simple is, you know, doesn't have anything. Um, and I actually said sort of um, presciently in the beginning that we would be straightforward. So not only does this cause an FAQ, but of course the balloon driver, as we saw, got it wrong and we had to put this thing saying, they you know, always sort of land in despite the convention. Yes, and that bit had to go in there and kind of stuff. Okay. So, screw it, little end in. Little end in everywhere. Um, simplicity for the win, little end in for the descriptors and the rings and the dip, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yay. Um, so if your ARM or x86 little end in, there's no change. It's all beautiful. Okay, so if you're PowerPC big end in, which I have some vested interest in, um, you are going to end up with this conditional Endian swap. Oh, hold on, you're a legacy device. That means I don't swap. Oh, you're a non-legacy device, so I actually now need to swap to the Endian. It's actually not that bad uh, on my rough, rough. well, looking at the code traces and stuff. Generally, GCC will put a single branch in, and you'll end up with a couple of extra branches. Um, it's not too bad. And of course, that branch will be always predicted really, really well. So it's not that bad. Um, perhaps the little Endian, of course, becomes a simplification, because then. You know, and PowerPC, IBM recently rediscovered that their chips can run both ways, so now they're the Endian. And um, so that's simplification. The RMBE guys, well, it's not clear because they don't actually work at the moment on Vertio. So if they wait long enough for the Vertio 1 standards, 1 0 standards out, then they won't need to worry about legacy and they'll just always swap. It's the poor people on the S390 who really uh, took the bullet for us on this one. And it, was, it really was them going, Look, you know, we don't want to block the standard. Um, so we are going to just suck it up and do this thing that is deeply, deeply unnatural in S390 and speak little Endian. So, um, yes. Uh, so actually, a, a huge public thanks to them for doing that. One option they could have done is on S390, we're big Endian. And everywhere else, we're little Endian. But you know that they would hit every single bug uh, imaginable over time as people made assumptions about, oh, it's little Endian everywhere. Oh, yeah, I forgot about you guys again. So, uh, in summary, we have a standard, we have a standards committee, um, and on Christmas Eve, you may have missed it, <laughs> we released the very first public review draft. So basically you go through that and you apply comments and we are required to respond to them. We're required to record them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So there are the URLs. The PDF is nominally canonical. Uh, it's generated from the text source, which is actually probably more canonical, but the PDF, uh, but the HTML is more readable. Um, this, we have a second working draft already in, this, in the works, and that will cover any feedback we get. And there are also some missing features. Um, some, one thing that missed out of the spec, um, and a bit more language tightening. So, are there any questions? Yes, Dave. Oh, really? Did they use... Oh, yeah, I vaguely recall that. Um, were they using the RP message stuff? Yeah, yeah, but RP message is the layer on top of Vertio that the... That they got. So, yeah, there actually seems to be some traction in a, like, a really weird way. The standard effort has pretty much stayed away from that. We pulled out the, the, the RP message chapter, didn't even try to get IP approval for that, um, because they're kind of weird. Um, we love that they're using our stuff, but whether we want to actually go as far as to put them in a standard or whether there should be an adjunct standard or not if they want to go that path. But, yeah, it, is actually, it, it actually seems to be catching on. Because people are like, well, this is actually the easiest way, and the infrastructure is already in the kernel. So, yeah, thanks for that. Yep. When you add Keith. indirect block, uh, indirect uh, tables, is yep. there some reason you just didn't remove the next chain from the, from the, uh, from the main grid? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry. The, the, so there was a question on uh, why 
when we added indirect, why didn't we just remove the whole next chaining thing? It turns out that um, if you're memory constrained and you can't do that allocation, it's much better to be able to at least shove it, you know, you'll lose some performance, but you can still shove it straight in the, in the main chain. Um, it doesn't turn out to be that bad when you implement it, because if you don't have this whole indirect and next thing at once, um, then you basically start on the main table. If there's an indirect, you're only allowed one indirect. You just flip to the table they've pointed you to. You can't keep going indirect. No, that is specifically banned in the spec, uh, and no one seriously suggested removing it. So. Any other questions? Yeah? Question here. Have we had any involvement from the non-Linux commercial hypervisor people? Um, I also took this opportunity to turn it into a standard in a public forum as an opportunity to go back around to them and say, hey, you know, are you interested? Um, I previously, like years and years ago, reached out to both VMware and Microsoft. Um, informally, you know, through technical contact, uh, didn't come up with anything. Um, my personal feeling is that with the Zen guys sniffing around, that leaves two left, and that's VMware and Microsoft. If we get one of them, we'll get the other one. Or if we convince one of them we're going to get the other one, we might get it. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, if one of them's got the checkbox of the, the Vertigo standard and the other one doesn't. Um, but frankly, we're kind of swelling around them at this point. Every little hypervisor out there, the ones I haven't heard of, are going, well, the easiest thing I can do is implement Vertigo. And that is enough for me. If they want to come on eventually, or if they want to just lose market share because they're not coming on board, both of those options are frankly about equal to me. I mean, I would love to have their involvement, and I'm looking forward to working with them on the Vertigo 2.0 spec. Yep. Um, how open is the Vertigo spec to something you recommend more? How onerous is the standards process been? Um, don't do it for fun. I would definitely say that. Um, I had hoped to have it finished, uh, you know, three months ago. We've now got draft one out, and we've got at least one more draft, maybe two. Um, so it's going to stretch into the middle of next year. And every time I give it a due date, add six months, because it's always been longer. Does that mean this year? Yeah, sorry, this year. Yeah, phew. <laughs> yes, you can read that both ways, yes. <laughs> okay, we have one last question. Um, yeah. Oh, but sorry, on the standards thing. Um, the people I've been working with, all the technical people, I haven't been dealing with any like language lawyers or anything like that. So that part of the process has been really smooth. But getting up to speed on how to run a standard and interfacing with the standards crowd and stuff, that's been this time consuming stuff. Do you think it's actually going to be the final thing that gets done is Vertigo handling the graphics subsystems? Or is there hope that that won't be the absolute last thing Vertigo manages to do? You know, there's an interesting talk later in the week. Uh, that I recommend that Dave Ailey, I know, has been uh, sweating about, sweating over. Um, and I recommend going to that and asking him that question. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you very much, Rusty. And <laughs>